Nice, Jeremy Hogue, maker of Glory and owner of Hogue Publishing. I literally just did uh, like a 20 minute video and didn't realize that uh, I wasn't recording. So it's gonna be hard to say all the same jokes again and still be funny. However, that's what we're gonna do. Many of you may have seen me before on Kickstarter where I use videos to help the customer get to know me and for me to try to sell my game. In those videos, I often emphasize that I wanted to be authentic rather than polished. This is an independent board game project. I'm not a big uh, company here and I want you to farm the full advantage of that. And that's all I have to give anyway, so I'd like that to be a plus rather than a minus. Okay, so if you have never seen Glory before, I will now show you the box cover so that you know that it is real outside of website images. This is it. That glowy box of light is because uh, my girlfriend gave me this strange object that apparently helps you do video. I've got like my, my phone is a mag magnetized to it and there's a mirror on it so I'm looking at myself which I am anyway I guess when the camera is flipped but I'm looking at myself twice over there's two of me um yeah lost my train of thought super authentic right uh anyway glory I'm gonna try to sell glory to you I'm gonna tell you about it I'm gonna tell you about Hulk publishing um my videos are almost always really long so uh you could already be gone here but maybe you exploited this website and came back Maybe you're still watching. I'll try to be entertaining. This is what your character looks like. That's the adventurer. Um, these are dry erase boards and they're really thick and they're super sturdy and they're shiny and they're nice and they're fun. And uh, you know, here's your life over here and you like just, woo. When you get quests, nobody knows what your quests are and you have to explore, You this is a roll and move. Let's start at the beginning. This is a 90 minute game, one to four players, hero fantasy, roll and move, player elimination, everything you're not supposed to do um, if you're a sophisticated uh, game enthusiast. I mean, if you're a designer in a sophisticated game enthusiast community. Okay, <clears throat> but I do those things. I'm gonna show you this game anyway. Yeah, dry erase. You're not supposed to do that either. You're supposed to have a million little pieces to track things, but I don't like that because I have a cat. <clears throat> so, you lay out this square board, and under towns and under layers, you put cards face down half under the board, and you have to roll and move to them to see what they are, and only you get to see them. So you write notes about them on your dry erase board. You're going to have goods, and you're going to have abilities uh, that are decks of cards, uh, you're going to accumulate, but, but your base stats are going to improve as well, potentially. Um, and for really big fights like layer fights, you'll have so many resources that usually players are going to need to pause, write on their board what their stats are going to be on turn one, turn two, under certain circumstances, all that good complicated stuff. This has one page of rules and it's good for noobs. It's good for young people and it's good for people who don't like reading a textbook before they can play their game for the first time. That's me. I once wrote for Dragon Magazine. Well, twice I wrote for Dragon Magazine. Um, some people will know what that is. Back before the advent of e-zines and the internet, magazines were popular and people would buy them. They'd buy them in the United Kingdom, they'd buy them in the USA, they'd buy them in Canada. Peso Publishing, Dragon Magazine, a supplementary magazine for Dungeons and Dragons. I'm bragging so that you feel like I know what I'm doing and you buy my game. Uh, <clears throat> Peso Publishing, yeah. The same guys who make Pathfinder, for those who, who are role players, you probably know what that is. Um, yeah, one page of rules. I really wanted this so that if you are a uh, highfalutin geek like myself, you can still play with your girlfriend or your brother who doesn't want to get quite as deep into the uh, game community as you do. 
you can be fully satisfied by this game. Uh, and so can your brother, or your girlfriend, or what have you, without getting overly intimidated. One page rules, I call it, and the page is this large. See, on the back of the character sheet is the legend. Besides this, you just have uh, another thing this size, which gives you um, really large font rules on how to battle. Lots of white space, unintimidating, and... Uh, I'm literally unboxing it right here. And this is the authentic authenticity over polish in uh, action. That's your rules, that's it. There's that floaty box. That's your battle rules, what? That's it for rules, you've seen them all. You can play, go right ahead. And then you, you just, you draw cards like this battle card, like this white dragon, and you go to layers, which you're gonna need to, um, which are, look at these full poster artworks. That's a really big deal. We have a really, 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 really good art in this game. And that accrues to the honor of Simon Seen uh, from Munich, Germany. I'm from Alberta, Canada. Well, I'm from Toronto originally, but I've moved to Alberta. Uh, <clears throat> but it also has to do with giving it enough time and attention, iterating enough, going through enough variations, and um, having good art dis discussions in art direction uh, and it, we came up with something that 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 if you if you look at reviews online from users um, it's it's pretty well universally agreed that it's great materials great art and this is an independent game project okay so I don't have a bunch of bosses hanging over my head um, making sure that everything looks conventional it isn't not all the conventional choices are made, which you may like some parts of it better than others, but you're getting a creative pursuit. You're really getting something that is, it's a product, but it's a little bit more like art and a little bit less like a, a product than, than usual. I got a lot of artists in my family. That was painted by my grandfather. So that's something Hope Publishing was going for from the onset. Okay, so uh, how many hours am I going to make this video again? I can't remember. We're just going to go on and on. I wonder how many people are still with me here. Oh, you're still with me. Let's keep talking. How do I sell this to you? This game has player elimination in it, and it's a roll and move. Okay, now I said that these are sins in the game design community. They are, and I love them. I love roll and move because um, I gotta speak abstractly, so brace yourself. Rolling a die and seeing what the outcome is and rolling to move are both expressions of a table, like, a, like an Excel table or a multiplication table. Roll and move tables your outcome onto a map. In this case, it's literally a map like the inside of a fantasy novel. It's a fine way of interacting with um, contingent datums, informations, which are different spots on the board. Now, you know, Roll and Move has, a, is, has an extremely bad rap, and if you hate it, go for it. But I love it. I think it's an amazing way, um, especially because I love fantasy maps. I love them, especially on the inside of books. Like, what draws you in more? To the prologue or chapter one than that map and wanting to trans transverse it and find out what it's like inside those cities and in those lands. So instead of having a board game with that as a background, it has nothing to do with anything. When you roll a move, you actually have a sense of distance. You actually have a sense of, of where you are, you know, and your quests force you to go around the map uh, if you choose to accept um, the quest tasks. <clears throat> so yeah, roll and move. I love it. You can you can change what you roll a little bit depending on your cards and your your health. You can push yourself a little bit, and uh, but you mostly don't land on what you want, like Monopoly. You land on something pretty good, and occasionally you'll have a boring turn, like Monopoly. Do you hate Monopoly? I love Monopoly. If you hate Monopoly. 
you will still love my game, because let me tell you about player and elimination, the other sin of game design. So why is player elim elimination a sin? It's kind of one of those things where everybody knows it. And I think that the assumed reason behind it is if someone's eliminated from the game, it's really boring for them and they have to watch everybody else play and they can't play anymore. But why would all player elimination be like that? Here's how player elimination works in glory. When you go into battles, you have so much health, and so does your opponent, which is not another player. It'll be a monster, like this white dragon, or the goblin king that I showed earlier, and now again. When the health of the beastie that you are attempting to slay is zero, you win. When your health reaches zero, you lose the entire game. Go make a sandwich. You're done. But you always know when you're one strike wall away from dying and can retreat. You go through rounds of combat. If you enter a round of combat in which you can go to zero health, and there's goods and fates and other things like this that can, you know, if your one strike wall might not kill you because you might have handy dandy super duper cards that help you out. But if all those are gone, or don't help you in this situation, and you roll anyway, and you have bad luck, you will be out of the game. So what happens in glory? So far, I'm not finished my argument for why you should love this. Stick with me. So there's something really good about this already, before I get to my, usually what's my most convincing point. But to me, this first point is, is equally convincing, if not more convincing, which is that um, if battles can't kill you, there is a completely different vibe to the game. When a battle finishes which you do not win, it is always by your own hand. You People just get used to retreating and applying, you know, applying reasonableness uh, to themselves. But so I got a new phone recently, and apparently when somebody calls you and you're doing a video, it literally stops the video. So this is the first video I've ever done where I'm splitting it into two takes. It is always one take. Well, actually it's three takes now because I tried to do this video first and it wasn't even playing. So I was talking about how when you retreat by your own hand, it is more difficult than when you put the card down and the rules have ended and it's no longer your turn. You must do it of your own accord, otherwise you will be removing yourself from the game. And there's no reason to do it. Like I say, there's nothing in the game that can kill you by luck. Except for exactly one fake card if you're in some weird circumstance in one situation and roll bad. But out of 500 playtests, approximately, I've never seen it come up. But I actually put it in the game just so that you're in a world in which you don't have a full control over your own life. But it never happens. It's just there for like philosophical design reasons. Um, <clears throat> the second reason why player elimination is good in this game is that what happens, the, the farther you go in the game, the more glory you get, you win by getting 20 glory, the harder it is to gain glory. The same goblins and creatures that gave you glory at the beginning of the game, if you draw them, no longer give you glory. You're beyond that. You have nothing to learn from defeating goblins anymore. So you end up having to go after layers. What this does is it can slow down the player at the end and give the players behind a, a chance to catch up. So I tried to make the game so it was a little bit like an accordion. So it's hard to get it takes a little bit to get your first couple of glory, mostly because people are going to visit towns, which is super peaceful to get quests and things. And then, you know, to get from zero to 12 or 15 glory is kind of hard, but your last battle to get your last five glory should always be pretty hard. Um, and so it's easier for people to catch up. So it's like an accordion, like someone gets ahead, everybody catches up, and then you're in a situation where you have a reason to take a risk. The game is going to come to a close. Someone is within striking distance of ending the game. They are, are have 15 or more glory, which means they only need one layer to win, most layers. 
and you might be at 13. So if this guy can move and, and take on a lair, you can see his goods and abilities and what his health is, um, then why, why, why shouldn't you go take on a lair and risk your game because the game is about to end anyway? Go take down a lair, maybe the closest one to that guy, or one that you know of from, from your scouting around the board um, throughout the hour that you've played, hour and a half maybe, and, um, and go out in a blaze of glory. Everyone will be entertained. You know, everybody will stop and watch you fight the Naga or the Black Dragon or the whatever. Um, instead of just kind of piddly, like most games, uh, there's a lot of great games that, that are really great but don't have this virtue. And what happens in those other games is you know who's going to win. And you just play out the last half an hour or sometimes even an hour um, knowing, knowing who wins. So is player elimination bad there? Mm-mm. No way. It is glorious. I had to stop myself from swearing there. Um, it's glorious. Or, you know, the guy ahead notices that you're catching up. You just went from 13 to 18 glory, and he's, at, he's only at 15. He was winning all game. You're two points from winning. A couple of fake cards could put you over the edge, you know. Um, he's going to go to, he might go to a lair when he's not at full health to try to steal the victory back, you know. So there's a lot of tension. So the player elimination mechanic gets exercised at the end of the game, not just randomly throughout, you know. And makes for epic endings. There's a certain reality to your decisions. Even the small ones, when you run away from a goblin, you're like, can't believe this goblin beat you, which usually doesn't happen, but happens from time to time. And when you do, it's much more shameful because you decide. People are like, are you sure? It's just a goblin. And you're like, no, if I lose this next roll, I'm out of the game. So you don't do it. And if you do, and you lose to a goblin... You're never going to live it down. <clears throat> so, roll and move, player elimination, best ever game. <clears throat> because of the short rules, you also face um, questions. You know, there's a, there's a, a um, card in the game called Charm Bells, and it allows you... The, the cards are dry erase too, eh? They're laminate, and the dry erase amazingly so some of your cards you interact with as well with your marker and uh i have prototypes that are two year old two years old and they still dry erase just fine and I, that might that might make me nervous if i hadn't designed it myself but uh works incredibly well uh and no markers for the cat to like the little tracking cubes or whatever for the cat to knock off the table <clears throat> plus you can draw mustaches on people anyway I forgot what I was saying, but maybe you should buy a quarter. Um, one joke I remember from my last video is uh, I proved, spontaneously proved to you in the camera that I was an independent designer and not a big business by showing this tube of Polysporin, which if I was a big business, I definitely would not do. I think it was really funny the first time I did it, but I, I don't know. I don't have the same inspiration now, but um, that was a tube of Polysporin that I just showed you for no reason. Uh, what else should we say about it? Charm Bells. Yeah, so this goods card is three times. It says thrice. You may add plus one to any roll. So what's great about that is that it's really short-winded. It's concise. This is what makes it unintimidating for everybody to play. But people start to realize, oh, maybe I can use that on a movement roll, not just a strike roll, which is what people think of prototypically. They think of it first. And then people start thinking, well, it doesn't... I can use them all at once, you know? Uh, and there's a lot of things like this where, you know, traditionally you would have a rule that says, don't worry, you can use it however you want and you can use it this way and that way. And then the next card has more rules on it. And then the next card has more rules on it. And I've got 20 pages of rules and it's in type 10 font instead of type 14 or 16 font, which that is. And, um, that's great, that's fine. But that's not how we're doing it at Holy Publishing.
That's not how we're doing it here. I can't remember what I said and what I said in the last video that didn't work. Uh, but one thing I want to mention is that this game is more artistic than normal because I am an independent designer and I'm not just trying to copycat what works out there. It really is meaningful to me to have some artistic merit in the game, whether it's theme, whether it's the, the player experience, or whether it's the actual painting or physical art. Um, so there's a bit of looseness. There's a bit of daring uh, in the game with regard to the art concept uh, and some of the writing as well. Uh, like the flavor text, um, th there's less of a demarcation between flavor text and uh, rules text on fake cards. There is, but less less than normal. Like for instance, there's a quest that asks you to go find a, a fake creature, which is a pixie, a gnome, a gold dragon, or a fairy. Um, and looking at, at fake cards. <clears throat> Here's a fake card. There's like, I think four different backgrounds for fake cards that are all sort of magical or fantasy looking landscapes. And it says, as night descends, you are invited to join the fire of a tiny gnomish family. You find their company enchanting, lifting your morale. You gain a plus two bonus on your next strike roll. So sometimes people, after getting that card, they'll go, they won't go to a, a battle right away. They might gear up and maybe try a layer because they've got like one good strike roll coming up. <clears throat> um, so like for instance this quest for fake creatures refers only to the flavor text part of that fake card so a little bit of reading comprehension is required which makes might make people who are used to most games in the game enthusiast community um, apoplectic. Um, but that's okay. i just an indie game designer. I'm gonna do things this way and change the world. Um, this painting is by my grandfather. There's a lot of art in my family, and I have a high respect for it. I can't draw very well myself, but I value it. <clears throat> okay. So, this is a really long video, by some standards. I enjoyed making it. I hope that you were entertained. I know that not everybody who hits the play button is going to watch it this far. And I probably sound like a chipmunk to someone who saw this on YouTube because they sped it up to times four because it's so long. But I dare to think that it is fun and useful to talk about design philosophy a little bit when it's an independent publisher. Putting things out, making decisions a little bit differently, trying to anyway. So I hope you like what you see. You should, it's amazing. Simon Scene's the artist. Mm -hmm. I already showed you the Polysporin. I don't have any jokes left. Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, email me, interact with me on boardgamegeek.com. Um, I sometimes get back within five or 10 minutes uh, or on Facebook, Glory on Facebook. Sometimes it takes me a couple days. Okay, I'm done. Have a glorious day. Check out my game. Buy it. Buy another one. Oh yeah, no matter how many you buy, the shipping costs are the same. So if you buy 10 or one copy, it's still $12 if you're in the USA. Uh, currency is in USD. Yeah. Polly's born.